Welcome to Freya's Fairy Tales, where we believe fairy tales are both stories we enjoyed as children and something that we can achieve ourselves. Each week, we will talk to authors about their favorite fairy tales when they were kids, and their adventure to holding their very own fairy tale in their hands. At the end of each episode, we will finish off with a fairy tale or short story read as close to the original author's version as possible. I am your host, Freya Victoria. I'm an audiobook narrator that loves reading fairy tales, novels, and bringing stories to life through narration. I am also fascinated by talking to authors and learning about their why and how for creating their stories. We have included all of the links for today's author and our show in the show notes. Be sure to check out our website and sign up for our newsletter for the latest on the podcast. Today is part one of two, where we are talking to Ty Carlson about his novels. Over the next two weeks, you will hear about writing in middle school and developing his writing as he got older, researching the querying process, strategizing with other authors to get your pitch out there, listening to and implementing the advice of others, learning how to promote your books on social media, and his favorite advice to write even if you don't feel like it. The Shadowless The Everstorm is merciless, The people who live beneath it are even worse. The earth has become a wasteland as a result of humanity's mistreatment. The sky has been dark for as long as anyone can remember, covered in an infinite rolling mass called the Everstorm. There are no trees. There is no hope. Unless, of course, you're one of the privileged who live in the protected cities beneath the domes. In these cities, there are trees— Parks full of vibrant grass and even waterfalls, all thanks to the solar energy harvested by those who have no choice but to brave the Everstorm. Shipley Bowden is a lowlife, working its way into the good graces of the citizens, hoping one day to be allowed a living space beneath the protective dome. But when he stumbles upon an orphaned girl in the ruins of the past, he decides to deliver her to the nearest settlement and be done with it. When Shipley runs afoul of violent marauders who call themselves the Red Kings, he must draw upon all the knowledge he's gained. Only now, he has a little girl to think about. So the podcast is Freya's Fairy Tales, and that is fairy tales in two ways. Fairy tales are something that we either watched or read or had read to us when we were little. Um, Also, the journey for you to spend weeks, months, or years working on your book to hold that in your hands is going to be a fairy tale for you. So the first question I like to start off with, what was your favorite fairy tale or short story when you were a kid? And did your favorite change as you got older? Yeah, so I loved reading when I was little. And we and we had a lot of books. My my parents were really, they really encouraged us to read. Um, mm-hmm. And they would limit kind of what we read. I didn't read any Stephen King until I was an adult. But, <laughs> That's um, probably good. <laughs> which which was good. I, but, I mean, I love it. But uh, my favorite fairy tale, I think, was either um, Puss in Boots or The Emperor's New Clothes. I got a kick out of Emperor's New Clothes. And I know it's kind of more like a morality story, but um, Hansel and Gretel, Gretel was always a winner. Um, mm-hmm. We got the toned down version where they weren't really eaten at the end. Um, they just kind of disappeared. <laughs> So that was that was fun. But um, as a as a high schooler, I got a complete works of Grimm's fairy tales. Mm -hmm. And that was eye opening to see all of and read all of the the actual stories of like how they originally kind of were and and Mm -hmm. more of a terror horror version of what I had known growing up. So that was really fun. But (laughs) Emperor's New Clothes is kind of the one that I, I always like go back to as. What, what do I remember in my childhood reading kind of over and over? It was like, oh, man, what an idiot. That guy thought he had clothes on. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and so at what age did you start writing your own stuff, whether that be short stories or actual novels? Yeah. So I read I started reading or, or writing. Um, my first like little story was was third grade. I wrote about um four other siblings that I had. It was called Quintuplets in the Family. Um, I only have three other siblings, and so I added a new one. <laughs> and then I wrote a story, it started a story, a novel in seventh grade um, called The Betrayal Trilogy, and I didn't finish book one. It's still on my computer at 162,000 words, oh, and gosh. it's not very good. 
I've <laughs> okay. written it, and I, I mean, I wrote in it from like seventh grade. Essentially, it's the Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time. It's kind of what it is. Okay. And I, uh, I have realized that I like the story, but it's always going to remain one of those just a fairy tale, really. Of like, I'm not going to finish that. That's my beginning. It helped me get where I am now. Uh-huh. Um, and so seventh grade is really where I started writing, writing, uh-huh. and then um, developed it through junior high and high school, and actually started writing seriously in college. Um, and then post college, had a, a idea for a book and and really kind of hit it hard to finish it just a few years ago. So, so you started, and that would be the bench, right? Yeah. And yeah, so that was the bench. How long from, you know, whatever you started the book with to the first draft, how long did it take you to draft the first one? Oh, I, I wrote, I had the idea for about a year um, of, of kind of thinking this would be interesting, an interesting story. This would be a cool idea. I talked to my wife about it, actually, kind of that was the, the impetus for the story is talking to her about an idea I had. Um, mm. And then I wrote on and off in it for about eight months and I got to 16,000 words, which is you know, like 30 pages. Um, and then decided that I actually, I actually wanted to be a writer Uh, Mm -hmm. before it had just been kind of a hobby of like, yeah, I can do this in my time off, or I can do this whenever I have time. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I found is that I didn't ever have time. And so because I didn't prioritize it. Right. So I decided, okay, so if I really want to finish this book, I'm going to have to buckle down and actually do it. So I, in June of 2019, I actually started writing the book um, diligently and I finished it December 2019, first draft. I spent 2020 going back through it and um, editing and, and making sure that the story made sense and and not editing in the sense of this doesn't belong, I'm going to take it out, this doesn't belong, I'm going to take it out, but editing in the sense of this needs to be a little bit more robust, this needs more explanation, this doesn't make uh-huh. sense, so let's suggest it. Um, I rewrote the first chapter a couple of times. Um, and so 2020 was was all of that. And by the end of 2020, I had um, I had what is now known as the bench, or mostly, and um, and spent the first part of 2021 um, querying and trying to look into uh, what it, what it would look like to get published. So it took about from from inception to completion about two and a half years for me to finish the first one. Okay, and so that and that included like self edits and stuff like that too, though. Yeah. So about yeah. seven yeah, months. Yeah, a couple rounds. Seven months for first draft, and then it sounds like the next thing you did was heavy developmental type yeah. editing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's, I never thought, because I'm such a wordy individual when I talk, I never thought I would be an underwriter. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. I added like ten to 20,000 words in my first edit, yeah. and I was like, wow. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm so glad that you said that, because... I went from 63,000 words to 81,000 words in my first edit. My first edit was mm-hmm. not add, not taking hardly anything out. It was adding a lot of content. And right. then my second edit, I added 30,000 words, which I also rewrote as part of the story. But um, it ended up it's almost double the size of my first draft simply because I added background and relevant information, you know. So, mm-hmm. uh, But Stephen King was like that, too. He claims that in his book. He adds stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're well, not it alone. Was, so I started my first book that is not the one that's about to come out for me. Um, but I started my th- first b- book, got about 30,000 words in. And then I'm like, I paused for like seven months working on, I also narrate audiobooks. So I was working on like narrating and prepping awesome. other people's audiobooks. Uh-huh. And so at the beginning of this year, 2020, whatever year we're in, 2023. <laughs> I went back to the beginning and was like, we're going to spend the time. We're going to focus. And I was like, 10 minutes a day. I can get everybody else's stuff done and focus on my book for 10 minutes a day. That's easy time to carve out. And I went back to the beginning of it and was like, this is all dialogue. (laughs) There's there's no internal dialogue to this. I'm like, this is going to take a lot of rewriting. (laughs) Yes. So, oh, and that that so was much. the point where I realized that I was a severe underwriter. <laughs> so now, yeah. the book that's about to come out for me, I made sure to focus on you need to add the inner dialogue as I was writing it. So it wasn't as bad. But I know whenever I go back to that first book, it's yeah. going to be a lot of adding stuff. In. <laughs> yeah. The struggle for me is realizing like I'm a big ideas person like, oh, wouldn't this be a cool plot? And then you realize 
in the middle of writing it, you have to describe what the sidewalk looks like and how their face looks and the color of the sky. And it's like, that has blue. nothing to do with how amazing this story is. Come on, let's go, let's go. It is, so it I is have, blue. that's what I had to add a lot of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, and there's like expressions and people around them and whatever, but here's the story. <laughs> so you said you spent some time querying. What did that process kind of mm-hmm. look like? Oh, that was hard. Querying is hard. <laughs> um, I spent about an hour a day researching. Uh, it was a, it was a process, and I had an Excel file um, and a and a notebook that I kept track of stuff in. I I spent an hour a day finding probably the best fits for what I wanted, um, what I wanted to query, which was like sci-fi. Uh-huh. Um, and so I was looking really specifically at at sci-fi agents and sci-fi publishers. And so I had uh-huh. a list. I built a list of potential agents and publishers. And then when I started querying, I would go to their um, websites, look what their query, um, either their query dates are, because a lot of, you know how it is, a lot of people or a lot of companies are, you can query between these times or these months, um, Mm -hmm. or I'm opening, I'm opening queries up in three months. So I would make notes of those and keep track of it. And then I would get their template for what those that their query needs to look like because all of them are different what do i need to include cover letter yes no that kind of thing and then i would make a list of all their requirements and then i would go um after that was complete i would just go down the list and i started with just the a's that i wanted to do and then the b's and the c's Uh and would query and it took i sent out um 78 78 total queries which is not very much compared to a lot right so did you actually end up getting signed? I did, but not from any query. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I had, I had uh, five partial requests, two full requests, and, um, and no acceptances, which I knew that it was going to be very difficult to get into this. But uh-huh. um, back when X was Twitter, there was a... Uh, I still call it Twitter, but... You know. uh, me too, I know. Um, <laughs> There was a con- not a contest, but there was like every quarter there was something called Pit Mad, and it was where uh-huh. um, you could pitch your book in in one tweet, you know, 240 characters, and if an agent or a publisher liked it, then that was essentially them requesting your your manuscript or at least a partial request. Uh-huh. So um, I did that three times, um, and it was the the middle of 2020, the end of 2020, and the beginning of 2020. Or, yeah, beginning of 2021, March. And, um, the first two attempts, I got a couple of likes and nothing came out of that. And then I, I actually went to Reddit and I requested some help and I posted my pitch and I got a lot of feedback and some of it was really hard and I totally revamped my, my process. And so, um, then I kind of got a little bit more serious about it and I, I downloaded a tweet deck, which doesn't exist anymore for Mac, um, where you can schedule out your tweets. And I scheduled out my tweets for, this is what my pitch is going to be like at 8 AM. This is what my pitch is going to be like at 11 AM. Uh-huh. And I would adjust it a little bit. And I, I rallied a lot, not not me. I rallied with a lot of, a lot of other authors and um, did a lot of retweets, did a lot of shares, did a lot of, a lot of comments. And so we kind of built this community on on uh, this these pit mad events where I was just retweeting hundreds and hundreds of these and people were retweeting hundreds of mine. And um, I got uh, like 12 likes. And um, out of those, I got three agents and two publishers and to uh, do pull requests. And then my publisher that I ended up signing with was Four Horsemen Publications. And they did a full request and then um, offered me a contract a few weeks later. They, when, when I got on the call with them, they were before the contract, they really wanted, um, they were excited about what I was writing, but, but they felt like it could be stronger. And so they asked if I would consider rewriting the first chapter. For me, it was rewriting it again. Right. Um, and I I was like, I mean, if it can be better, yeah, of course I'll re- rewrite it. Right. Um, and they were really wonderful about, we think that your writing is fantastic, which of course was nice to hear. But um, they said, you know, we think it could be better because the way that you have it started is kind of a trope. It, it doesn't seem very believable whenever you get into the story. We really love the story, but the, the beginning is a little bit rough. And uh-huh. so I said, yeah, absolutely. If, if you think it could be better like that, I'm not so attached to my writing or um, so naive to think that my writing is perfect right now. So they said, uh-huh. OK, great. So rewrite it, submit it again and let us know. Um, and I took a week to rewrite that first chapter, um, totally revamped it. And it became um, and the, that chapter became what is now the bench's first chapter. 
and they offered me a contract after that. And and after I was after I signed with them, and the contract is is really great, and I, it's a five year contract. Um, I talked to them, and and they said, you know, it's it was so nice and and encouraging that you were willing to um, to rewrite the first chapter because there were some authors that we've requested that with, and they said absolutely not. And mm-hmm. I I couldn't understand that because if I thought someone came to me and said we like your writing, but but it could be stronger, I would definitely want an outsider's perspective to be able to be more, um, hold a little bit more weight than mine. Of right. course, I think my writing is good. I, if I didn't think it was good, I wouldn't submit it. Right. But, um, <laughs> I know it's not perfect. So to have them say that was really encouraging for me because I want to make sure that I'm, I'm still developing as a writer and as an uh-huh. author. Um, and having someone else say it's good, but it could be better. Just affirmed that, you know? Right. That's, that's so weird. So I just had an author. Well, more specifically, I was terrified to have beta readers read my book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so yeah. I got beta readers on TikTok and there was like five of them that actually went through my book and like four of them. Th- well, the prompt that I gave all of them was basically I wanted them to developmental edit kind of because I yeah. had done my edits. Um, but I was like, I need an outsider's perspective of like, hey, this doesn't make sense. It m- makes yeah. sense to me because I wrote it, but right. it may not make sense to other people. So that yeah. was like the prompt I gave them and four of them followed that prompt. And then one of them completely destroyed my book, <laughs> completely destroyed it in a good way, though, in a yeah. good way, yeah. in a very helpful, like, you don't need to say this because it's implied. You don't need to do this because, like, you've already said it 15 times in the previous three paragraphs and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, that same beta reader tagged me in another author looking for beta readers and was like, you can ask Freya you know, about me as a beta reader. And so my message to that author was long. But in that message, I was like, listen, you need other feedback and you need to set your ego aside because they're not there to hate on you. They're not there to be mean. They are there because they want to help you make your your book the best that it can be. And you need to set your ego aside because if you're going to think like I'm the best writer ever, you're not no one is <laughs> so, yeah like you need to set your ego aside but I was like this particular beta reader I'm like she will tear your book apart but she will then help you put it back together if you ask her for help yeah if, if you just want to take her feedback and implement it and be done with it that's fine too but you know if you know if you give a suggestion if a beta reader gave me a suggestion sometimes it wasn't quite clear like well what how do I fix that <laughs> so right just having right. the you know mind to allow the feedback because if they are volunteering to help you and spend all this time with you they want to make it better and clearly with like a publisher their goal obviously is to sell copies so they want to make it as best as they can to sell the copies exactly it's exactly it if they're if you're not willing to accept that you're you're very imperfect and your writing is is not not good in some spots um you're you're not going to be successful. That's just kind of the bottom line. And that's something that I, I really try to internalize is that I know that I can write and I know I can write well, but I, I may not be able to write well all the time or about mm-hmm. everything. And so to have someone else come in and be able to say, I, my editor is really wonderful. And she, a lot of times she'd be like, this is, I get the idea of this, but it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Th- uh, that's great advice. I, I, so I would message her and I'd be like, okay, so what would you, would you suggest this or, or what about this? I changed it. Um, and it just having kind of a team that you both trust and that trusts you is uh-huh. really valuable because your beta readers, if they wouldn't spend the time doing that, if they didn't think this isn't going to make a difference, they're not going to change it. Uh-huh. So you've got to, you know, it's a two way street. Well, and two, like, so as a debut too, you're looking at, um, no one knows how you write or how you're going to behave or if you're going to implement any of this feedback at all. So for those five people that saw that I implemented 99% of their feedback, they can then tell people in the future, right. like, hey, she listens, <laughs> she's going to do, unless it completely, like there was a couple yeah. things that went against like, oh, that's a future book explanation thing. So I can't explain it here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. This is foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you go through the querying process. You don't get picked up. I actually have another author I narrated for that got picked up in the pitch mad too. (laughs) So (laughs) not my first time hearing about that. Um, So you you go through that. How long did the process from them signing you to getting it out? How long was that process? Um, um, Let's see. We signed in 
in June of 2021, and the bench came out December 2021. So it okay. was pretty um, fast just a, just for publishing. Months. Yeah, they're very they're very quick. Um, they're big they're big thing, and I love my publisher. I would not I would not trade them for for anything. Um, their big thing is we will will edit your book, but we want you to have kind of creative control over it and. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not been one time where I've pitched an idea and they've been like, no, we don't want that as part of our, as part of our, our kind of repertoire. Um, they've been like, okay, that sounds great. So it's been really fun. <laughs> um, and, and I have, uh, two, two works a year contract. So every six months I'm, I'm pumping out another one. Oh, so you basically have a five year, whatever you put out, they get first dibs kind of thing. Yeah. So they, so I submit to them, um, they publish it under their, under their kind of umbrella and, um, I can switch. I've got a couple of series. I've got the, the Deary saga, which is the first one, the, the first book of the bench and then the favorite and, uh, the shadowless. And then the, this fourth one that comes out January convergence of gods is all the Deary. And then the fifth book that I started, um, and I'm, I'm submitting it in December is the first book in the Dominus trilogy, which is, um, like true sci-fi spaceships, aliens, lasers, planets, that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> nice. so it's like genuine space opera. It really is kind of what it is. Okay. <laughs> so that's going to be fun. So it comes out in December, the first book. What did you do when it came out? Did you know to promote it? Did you kind of just like freak out? Like yeah. what happened? <laughs> I, I wasn't quite sure. And this was a little bit, be- I mean, I think, I don't think I was on TikTok yet for this. I don't even know if TikTok was popular enough yet um but i i did a lot of twitter was my like main platform so i had a lot of of followers on twitter and um a lot of really good community on twitter and i promoted it through there and i did a lot i did some on instagram i was never a big fan of instagram i'm still not a huge fan of instagram but (laughs) they're all a necessary evil to me exactly um so I, i did i did do a lot of of my own marketing on twitter um, and then, uh, 2022, I think is whenever I joined t- TikTok and really started pushing my, my stuff there. Um, and it's a lot of, I, I like TikTok way more because you can, uh, there's a lot more engagement, I think being able mm-hmm. to, to, to reply automatically with video and, and, and just the way that the platform is set up, I think it's, it lends itself to being more fan based and creator based, um, interactions. So mm-hmm. that's what I use. So you do that. The how I found out about you, you did a giveaway a couple months ago oh, that yeah. my, my yeah. husband won the books in. Oh, so, awesome. So when did you start doing was that the first one that you had done? Or have you done that, multiples of um, those? I think that was the first giveaway um on TikTok that I had done. I'd done a giveaway on Twitter for a signed copy of the bench. Um I think that was when at launch too, back in December, January, 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was the first like, like major giveaway where I, where I really promoted it and, and worked really hard to kind of put it out there as much as I could. Yeah. And so now I've, now that I follow you, I see your videos sometimes. So kind of like what, um, now that you have three books out, has your, what you do to promote things changed? I know you said you added in TikTok. Yeah. Like, what has the learning curve uh, been like? <laughs> it's steep and it changes constantly. Like, yes. like what's popular on TikTok today? You know, you wake up and, it, and yesterday it was like memes and today it's the Taylor Swift songs and tomorrow it's going to be, you know, whatever else. And so um, it's it's a lot keeping up with it. And I don't keep up with it very well. I'll do um, <laughs> my, my own like what I feel like a promotional video is where I'll explain what the bench is about or I'll explain what the favorite's about. Um, I'll do an excerpt from the favorite or the shadow list, or, uh, one time I did a TikTok live where I read the first chapter of the, of the shadow list or the prologue. Um, and that was really cool. There was a lot of people that thought that was a lot of fun. And so I've, I think I'm, I lean more towards being, um, con- conversational with, with TikTok videos. There's not a lot that are like sound bites where I copy them and, and do my, uh, like on twist on those. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, you got to mix it up because that's what that's what TikTok demands. <laughs> so, so I do. So now you um, also have audiobooks out. How did that? Yeah. Were you involved in? Did your publisher do those? Did you do those? Mm-hmm. How'd that come about? 
Yeah, so my publisher does uh, typesetting, cover art, audiobooks, um, editing, all of that. They they do that all of that for me. But I did get to pick the um, narrator, and so uh, kind of a funny story is uh, my narrator's name is Ken Allen, but he has a pen name or the equivalent of a pen name, a voice name, maybe mm-hmm. of what he would go under as when he when he narrated the other books that he's done before. Um, Mm -hmm. My publisher started out as an erotica publisher um, almost exclusively. And so he would narrate all of the erotica books and his narration name when I got it was Ken. And then there was another person named Seth and another person named John. And I listened to them read the first chapter of my book and I decided which one I wanted. I was like, you know, I really like Ken. I think he's going to be great. Um, and they were like, okay, perfect. That's that's who we'll use for for all of your books. They want to kind of keep maintain that same um, the same voice for all of the stories that you, you tell. So uh-huh. um, my book came out, and I was super excited. And the audio book came out, and I look and I said, it's narrated by. Wait a second, who's it narrated by? Ken B. Erotica. And I was like, wait, that's Ken. That's Ken. That's my narrator. His pen name or voice name was Ken Erotic. And I didn't know that because I just had Ken. And so my book is not erotic. So I thought that was <laughs> hilarious when my when people were like, oh, who narrates your book? And I'd, I'd say, well, Ken <laughs> the erotic narrates my book. <laughs> it, was, it was very fun. But now he does much more than just erotica. And so he's changed his, when he does my books, he's Ken Allen. Um, but that first one there for a while was narrated by Ken B. Erotic. He's awesome. I, I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> so I started narrating in September of 21. And then in January of 22 is when I got my first fiction. So prior to that, I did nonfiction. And author that I landed the first fiction book with was like, I'm planning on writing some more erotic stuff. You know, do you want to keep doing this under the same name or you want a different name or whatever? And I'm like, all right, we're going to we're going to do it. So I pick a name and I tell all the fiction books that I had landed, like, hey, this is the name I'm going to be narrating it under. That'd be Freya Victoria or it wasn't Freya Victoria at the time. Um, And then one of them, I guess, looked up that name on Audible to see like what other books I had done. And they're like, hey, did you do this like massive quantity of erotica stuff? (laughs) And I'm like, no, let me pick a different name. (laughs) So I ended up with Freya Victoria, which works great. That's the name that I've been promoting myself under for a long time now. Two years now? (laughs) Almost, because I I started it in like January of 22. So we're coming up on two years under Freya. Um, Because the other name that I used, I still do, if I ever land a nonfiction, which I haven't in a very long time, I would still do it under the nonfiction name. Yeah. Same with like children's books or things that don't want to be grouped in with the spicier fantasy and romance books I've done. Um, But yeah, (laughs) so it's it's funny that you said that because a lot of narrators, I think typically I see them call it a pseudonym instead of a pen name. Yes. but yeah, we'll use different names for like different genres. Same as authors. Authors do the same yeah. thing. Yeah. So my you author, said, my, go ahead. My publisher said, if I wanted to write erotica, I would need to change my name. And I said, well, I don't have any plans on that. So we'll just, <laughs> we'll talk that first later. <laughs> You're like, maybe not. <laughs> I get embarrassed when I write the one sex scene in the bench. I, I don't think I can write erotica. I, I'm much too, <laughs> I'm much too shy about it. I was a little bit scared for the first book that is about to come out I was like I don't know like I have no problem with spicy books or writing spice no problem with any of that at all um but my brother-in-law was one of my beta readers (laughs) and so I was like maybe I don't want him to read that so I was like really really scared and then like my characters kind of took over it and ended up being a super super slow burn book but for his copy before it gets to the spice there's like two chapters of spice in the whole book and so, and they're at the very, very end. So I had like a like star, star warning. There are sex scenes past <laughs> this point. Like, <laughs> if you continue yes. reading, that's on you. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Whew. He he said he basically just skimmed those sections. <laughs> yeah, which is fine. You'll yeah. get feedback from other people. It's fine. exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And mine, like yours, it was for me. It was the first six chapters were the roughest that needed the most rewriting. 
And then after that, even my editor didn't have a lot to say after the first yeah. six chapters. <laughs> you kind of hit the groove and then things just yep. kind of fall into place. Yeah, I get yep. it. Ty liked Puss in Boots growing up. Today we'll be reading Charles Perrault's version. Don't forget we're reading Le Mort de Arthur, a story of King Arthur and of his noble knights of the round table on our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. The Master Cat or Puss in Boots There was a miller, who left no more estate to the three sons he had, than his mill, his ass, and his cat. The partition was soon made. Neither the scrivener nor attorney were sent for. They would soon have eaten up all the poor patrimony. The eldest had the mill, the second the ass, and the youngest nothing but the cat. The poor young fellow was quite comfortless at having so poor a lot. My brothers, said he, may get their living handsomely enough by joining their stocks together. But for my part, when I've eaten up my cat and made me a muff of his skin, I must die with hunger. The cat, who heard all this, but made as if he did not, said to him with a grave and serious air, do not thus afflict yourself, my good master. You've only to give me a bag and get a pair of boots made for me that I may scamper through the dirt and the brambles, and you shall see that you've not so bad a portion of me as you imagine. Though the cat's master did not build very much upon what he said, he had, however, often seen him play a great many cunning tricks to catch rats and mice, as when he used to hang by the heels or hide himself in the mule and make as if he were dead, so that he did not altogether despair of his affording him some help in his miserable condition. When the cat had what he asked for, he booted himself very gallantly, and putting his bag about his neck, he held the strings of it in his two forepaws, and went into a warren where was great abundance of rabbits. He put bran and so thistle into his bag, and stretching himself out at length, as if he had been dead, he waited for some young rabbit, not yet acquainted with the deceits of the world, to come and rummage his bag for what he had put into it. Scarce was he lain down, but he had what he wanted. A rash and foolish young rabbit jumped into his bag, and Monsieur Puss, immediately drawing close the strings, took and killed him without pity. Proud of his prey, he went with it to the palace and asked to speak with his majesty. He was showed upstairs into the king's apartment, and making a low reverence, said to him, I have brought you, sir, a rabbit of the warren which my noble lord, the Marquis of Carabas, for that was the title which Puss was pleased to give his master, has commanded me to present to your majesty from him. Tell thy master, said the king, that I thank him, and that he does me a great deal of pleasure. Another time he went and hid himself among some standing corn, holding still his bag open, and when a brace of partridges ran into it, he drew the strings and so caught them both. He went and made a present of these to the king as he had done before of the rabbit which he took in the warren. The king in like manner received the partridges with great pleasure and ordered him some money to drink. The cat continued for two or three months, thus to carry his majesty from time to time game of his master's taking. One day in particular, when he knew for certain that the king was to take the air along the river side with his daughter, the most beautiful princess in the world, he said to his master, If you will follow my advice, your fortune is made. You have nothing else to do but go and watch yourself in the river. In that part I shall show you and leave the rest to me. The Marquis of Carabas did what the cat advised him to, without knowing why or wherefore. While he was washing, the king passed by, and the cat began to cry out as loud as he could, Help, help, my lord, Marquis of Carabas is drowning. At this, the king put his head out of his coach window, and finding it was the cat who had so often brought him such good game, he commanded his guards to run immediately to the assistance of his lordship, the Marquis of Carabas. While they were drawing the poor Marquis out of the river, the cat came up to the coach and told the king that while his master was washing, there came by some rogues, who went off with his clothes, though he had cried out, thieves, thieves, several times as loud as he could. This cunning cat had hidden them under a great stone. The king immediately commanded the officers of his wardrobe to run and fetch one of his best suits for the Lord Marquis of Carabas. The king received him with great kindness, and as the fine clothes he had given him extremely set off his good mien, 
for he was well made and very handsome in his person. The king's daughter took a secret inclination to him, and the Marquis of Carabas had no sooner cast two or three respectful and somewhat tender glances, but she fell in love with him to distraction. The king would needs have him come into his coach and take part of the airing. The cat, quite overjoyed to see his project begin to succeed, marched on before and meeting with some countrymen, who were mowing a meadow, he said to them, "'Good people, you who are mowing, if you do not tell the king that the meadow you mow belongs to my lord, Marquis of Carabas, you shall be chopped as small as mince meat.' The king did not fail asking of the mowers to whom the meadow they were mowing belonged. "'To my lord, Marquis of Carabas,' answered they all together, for the cat's threats had made them terribly afraid. "'Truly a fine estate,' said the king to the Marquis of Carabas. "'You see, sir,' said the Marquis, "'this is a meadow which never fails to yield a plentiful harvest every year.' The master cat, who still went on before, met with some reapers and said to them, "'Good people, you who are reaping, "'if you do not tell the king that all this corn belongs to the Marquis of Carabas, "'you shall be chopped as small as mince meat.' The king, who passed by a moment after, would needs know to whom all that corn, which he then saw did belong. To my lord Marquis of Carabas, replied the reapers, and the king again congratulated the Marquis. The master cat, who went always before, said the same words to all he met, and the king was astonished at the vast estates of my lord Marquis of Carabas. Monsieur Puss came at last to a stately castle, the master of which was an ogre, the richest had ever been known, for all the lands which the king had then gone over belonged to this castle. The cat, who had taken care to inform himself who this ogre was, and what he could do, asked to speak with him, saying he could not pass so near his castle without having the honor of paying his respects to him. The ogre received him as civilly as an ogre could do, and made him sit down, "'I have been assured,' said the cat, "'that you have the gift of being able to change yourself "'into all sorts of creatures you have a mind to. "'You can, for example, transform yourself into a lion or elephant and the like.' "'This is true,' answered the ogre very briskly. "'And to convince you, you shall see me now become a lion.' "'Puss was so sadly terrified at the sight of a lion so near him "'that he immediately got into the gutter.' not without abundance of trouble and danger because of his boots, which were ill-suited for walking upon the tiles. A little while after, when Puss saw that the ogre had resumed his natural form, he came down and owned he had been very much frightened. I have been moreover informed, said the cat, but I know not how to believe it, that you have also the power to take on you the shape of the smallest animals. For example, to change yourself into a rat or a mouse. But I must own to you, I take this to be impossible. Impossible, cried the ogre. You shall see that presently. And at the same time changed into a mouse and began to run about the floor. Puss no sooner perceived this, but he fell upon him and ate him up. Meanwhile, the king who saw as he passed this fine castle of the ogres had a mind to go into it. Puss, who heard the noise of his majesty's coach running over the drawbridge, ran out and said to the king, "'Your majesty is welcome to this castle of my lord Marquis of Carabas.' "'What? My lord Marquis?' cried the king. "'And does this castle also belong to you? There can be nothing finer than this court and all the stately buildings which surround it. Let us go into it, if you please.' The marquis gave his hand to the princess and followed the king, who went up first. They passed into a spacious hall where they found a magnificent collation which the ogre had prepared for his friends, who were there that very day to visit him, but dared not to enter knowing the king was there. His majesty was perfectly charmed with the good qualities of my lord Marquis of Carabas, as was his daughter who was fallen violently in love with him, and seeing the vast estate he possessed, said to him after having drank five or six glasses, it will be owing to yourself only, my lord Marquis, if you are not my son-in-law. The Marquis, making several low bows, accepted the honor which his majesty conferred upon him, and forthwith, that very same day, married the princess. Puss became a great lord, 
and never ran after mice anymore, but only for his diversion. The Moral How advantageous it may be, by long descent of pedigree, to enjoy a great estate, yet knowledge how to act we see, joined with consummate industry, nor wonder ye thereat, doth often prove a greater boon, as should be to young people known. Another If the son of a miller so soon gains the heart of a beautiful princess and makes her impart, sweet languishing glances, eyes melting for love, it must be remarked to find clothes how they move, and that youth a good face, a good air with good mien, are not always indifferent mediums to win. The love of the fair and gently inspire the flames of sweet passion and tender desire. Thank you for joining Freya's Fairy Tales. Be sure to come back next week for the conclusion of Ty's journey to holding his own fairy tale in his hands, and to hear another of his favorite fairy tales.